The introductory lecture of this unit had already prepared us to understand that there is an ongoing tendency to refute design as an area that is object-orientated. Object-orientated design, as we have learned in Unit 3, is an approach that was prevalent during the 1930s and up until the 1980s. It is still a popular approach in many industries, however contemporary discourses in design are attempting to find new ways of conceptualizing design in relation to larger systems within which it is involved. In Unit 3, we also saw that object-orientated design stems from and nourishes a certain relationship between design and its markets. Namely, the design's purpose under this approach is to offer consumers new merchandise, which does not always correspond with essential needs. In fact, design was a means of inventing new social needs and give rise to new desires that will encourage consumerism. A criticism of this economical approach springs in the 1960s and 1970s when left-wing movements and anti-consumerism schools in art and in design would express concern about how consumer culture changes social interactions, creating interpersonal communication based on projections and conditionings rather than direct contact with the other. Criticisms of the consumerist approach will even find scientific support in the evolving field of ecology. The seminal book, The Limits to Growth, published in 1972, would encourage a different understanding of human relationship with natural resources. In the next sessions, we will delve deeper into the relationship between design and natural ecologies. For now, let us try and understand design in relation to social interactions. A central figure in left-wing criticism of the 60s and 70s would be Guy Debord, founder of the Situationist International Art Movement. In his book, The Society of the Spectacle, he contemplates the way in which product-centered economies recreate and shape our social relations through our self-image. The Boer looks at social relations as they are mediated through products that we use, the clothes that we wear, and the image that we are looking to project. His main concern is that this image replaces our real identity and that communication turns superficial as people only communicate through the external projection of themselves. His book has been a great influence on how people understand consumerism, not merely as an amusing social phenomena, but as a set of new conditions for the construction of identity and the facilitation of social ties. In relation to this concern, Jean Baudrillard develops his own theory of value to complete that of Marx. In his books and articles, he defines an additional component in value constructs that he would term the symbolic value. This is the value of an object in relation to its value as a signifier or a projection of the self. In Baudrillard's development of this theory, he describes a whole layer of interpersonal communication mediated by objects of desire. These objects are imbued with symbolic value, which he calls the hyperreal and he will relate to the notion of simulacra, the inauthentic and indirect representation of a signifier without an original sign. In his renowned book, Fatal Strategies, he would take this criticism even further, depicting a whole society where objects have actually become social agents in and of themselves, controlling behavior and attitudes, and shifting society's perception of subjectivity. So how to approach design as a social agent? as a shaper of social relations and identities. Let's take, for example, the smartphone and the pioneering design that allowed its massive penetration to the market, the iPhone. The aesthetic of the iPhone turned it into an object of desire per se. It fast became a status symbol. But how and why? Let's analyze and speculate. The design of the object here is in itself already a complex system of design parameters. In analyzing, we should take in the device itself, the software, but also the software interface, the touch screen, an innovation that would change the way we interact with all computational interfaces. The design of the iPhone was so simple in comparison to other devices at that time that it was imbued with a certain mystery, a certain unknowing as to how it actually functions. As such, it stimulated a curiosity. The smooth touch of the screen, which had no visceral guidance for the finger, transformed the operation of the machine so that it had become clean and virtual. In this sense, it had created almost an erotic relationship with the user. Eroticism here is viewed as the constant tension between revealing and concealing the way in which a thing operates, the hunger to know, to penetrate into the functioning of a thing, and yet at the same time always remain outside of it. 
its substantial weight yet relatively thin appearance played on the same idea. The weight gave it substance, while it being flat emphasized the screen, the visual aspect in a virtual sphere of interaction. Exactly that space of the hyperreal which Baudrillard speaks of. Now, let's think about the interactions that the iPhone encourages. Its design minimized the visceral aspect of interaction and based most of the operations on haptic sensation. The iPhone encourages communication that is mainly based on two senses, sight and touch. Another means of understanding the erotic appeal of this design is exactly the combination of these two prime senses. If we think of media as Marshall McLuhan would think of it, as an extension of our bodies, then the iPhone plays and is an extension not only of our ears and our mouth, but also functions as an extension of our eyes and our working memory. As such, it meant to replace not only the old telephony system, but to be part of a larger network of devices and in some ways replace our personal computers. So what happens to this tool once it incorporates the ability to perform more than the task of direct communication via voice? In what way did it change the way we communicate with one another? Smartphones require immediate response, occupying a range of senses and attention mechanisms. They manage nearly every field of our lives, work, family, romantic and sexual relationship, and so on. In correlation with the internet and our use of social networks, it has a direct influence on our perception of time. As such, it is recalibrated all definition of ideal time and real time, accentuating an immediacy of reaction, speeding up solicitation reaction mechanism within us, encouraging the constant movement within a perpetual progressive present, which does not seem to accumulate to any resolution or an end. There are no divisions of time or space within the iPhone. All is managed via one smooth screen operator. Philosopher Laurent Berland would term this time-space social construct as a crisis ordinariness, the feeling of a permanent crisis, whereby we are constantly asked to react in urgency to different stimuli which we did not have to react to in the past. In our relationship with our phones, how do we project this level of urgency on ourselves and our relationships, personal, familial, professionals? How much are we able to sustain a waiting which is not entertained by an immediate social response? And if we are meant to use these devices in changing contexts like work, how would the device change our relationship to our work or our career? How would our working hours look like? Can we ask ourselves what is the level of emotional strain this device and design requires of us by setting such conditions of communication? Looking at the same example from another angle, the smartphone has affected working times and working hours, adding to the blur between work and leisure, a change conductive to what some theoreticians would underline as a new working class, that of the precariat. This is a working class characterized by an instability of its income and its perpetual movement from one working place to another. This movement could not have been accomplished without the possibility of being available all the time in this constant, ordinary crisis of existence. To conclude, the design of a new technology or the design of a new interface is intricately involved in a whole ecology of emotional dependency and fosters a new cultural and social relation that we have not been accustomed to before. And so those objects of affection cannot be regarded as pure objects as such. They are platforms in an ongoing process of reshaping our identities and relations with others and with our economies.